Hello, Snackers. I'm Julio Fernandez with the Cisco Learning and Certifications team. Hey, Snackers. This is Kareem Iskander. I'm a lead technical advocate with Cisco Learning and Certifications. And welcome to a special episode of Snack Minute from Cisco Live Amsterdam. Snack Minute is your weekly 10-minute bites of learning covering coding, learning, and some cool stuff that we do here. And the cool stuff we're going to talk about is the metaverse with our special guest, Annie. Hi, I'm Annie Hardy. I'm Cisco's senior visioneer. That's my legit title. That's, that's, that's real. Annie, that sounds super cool, but you're going to have to expand a little bit. What's a visioneer? So a visioneer, visioneering is the study of human-machine interaction. Uh, so what I focus on is I look at how humans and machines are going to interact in the future. I'm a futurist. And basically, I look at the future of the internet. So when we talk about the internet, we look at the infrastructure layer. So we're looking at material science. We're looking at fiber. We're looking at uh, the privatization of space and how that's impacted Skylink and satellite networks. And then we look at the future of security, looking at quantum, looking at um, platforms, looking at applications. But we take it all the way up to the human level. We're looking at urban decentralization, the movements of money and people and economies. And then also trends and interfaces like the metaverse. Wow. So Fascinating. from your point of view, what is the metaverse? Oh, what a great question. I love this. So a lot of people think the metaverse is a virtual reality gaming cloud. And the challenge is that's only a part of the story. Uh, I define the metaverse as augmented immersive social or virtual experiences. Uh, there's a spatial component, presence matters. Uh, and so it's actually a really complicated thing. But if you think about it, uh, Pokemon Go, it's part of the metaverse. Cisco Hologram, part of the metaverse. And Decentraland is part of the metaverse. These are all different components of this virtual, immersive, augmented experience we're going to have now, but increasingly in the future. So <clears throat> before we get into the the metaverse and the risk of the metaverse. Can you expand a little bit on what is Cisco actually doing in the metaverse? Are you allowed to talk about it since it's a future? I can talk about something. So one of the things I just talked about is Cisco WebEx Hologram. So if you don't know, uh, our collaboration team actually created a solution called Hologram. Enables It enables people to be able to communicate in a way that creates a dimensional experience. So you can use LeapFrog headsets or um, Microsoft HoloLens um, and be able to actually engage with someone in a phone call or in a WebEx call where uh, they have a 3D presence. You can actually manipulate objects as well uh, within the context of hologram. It's really cool. So that's one of the edge, like one of the cases that we have of what we're actually building. Um, another is we have a partner of Vection Technologies who's actually here now. They have the first metaverse plugin uh, inside WebEx. It's called 3D Frame. Uh, and, and what that enables customers to do is to actually, you can, you can buy right now, you can get a subscription, you can upload assets and create virtual spaces where, again, people can manipulate assets inside uh, their WebEx platform. Um, so that's another example. So I'm sitting at home on my Desk Pro or DX, and I have this plug-in add-on, and I could, from where I am, interact with that virtual space. Yes, and, and the cool thing about it, and I think this is a really important point, when we think about the metaverse, everyone's like, oh, you know, we're not going to be walking around in our VR goggles, right? They, they can't imagine. It's hard for them to imagine a world where everybody's going to walk around in that. But that's why when we redefine the metaverse from a virtual reality experience to an extended reality experience, all of a sudden when you think AR, uh, you're thinking a digital filter on the physical world. Um, and then what happens is that device gap, if, if you don't have to wear goggles and you separate that from your perspective of the metaverse, all of a sudden you're able to have 2D experiences that still represent augmented and virtual uh, worlds. Uh, and, and what Vection is built as part of that because you can be in your goggles in a WebEx meeting or you can be on your desktop. And so as we look at the device gap, we don't have all of the VR headsets that are gonna be bringing this gaming cloud to life. But what we do have is we have the ability to bridge the gap by allowing people to engage on their phone, on their desktop, or in VR. And I really think that's, yeah, I think that's going to be 
critical as we look because these headsets are really expensive. They're clunky. They're not, you know, they're not easy to use yet. Right. And they'll get better. But until they do, solutions like 3D Frame are bridging the gap. So, Annie, you wrote a paper about the exclusions, the risk of exclusions in the metaverse. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. So what's interesting about metaverse spaces is also what's dangerous about metaverse spaces. Um, because what happens is that they are designed to change reality. They augment it or they create virtual reality entirely. And if you think about how something is crafted to manipulate the way you feel, we have to pause for a minute and think about the potential harm. Um, and so people are talking a lot about defining the metaverse. They're talking about how exciting it is. There was not enough and there has not been enough conversation about the possible risks. And one of the risks is that the people creating the metaverse are creating it and it is going to have bias included in the design. And so that's what the paper talks about. It talks about the risk of exclusion and it talks about different ways that this can come to life, that this is already being brought to life and then also what we can do with it. Can, can you expand a little bit about um, how are we putting any, if any, guardrails around the metaverse? Because it's to me, it's like it's an open-ended world that you could potentially do everything and anything that you are allowed to do in the real world. And so what is it that, you know, like in the real world, we have governance, we have laws, regulations. What's that like in the metaverse? Okay, this is... This is a very interesting question. So first off, I think I have to, I have to dive in a little bit to Web3. Uh, so Web3 is a, an ideology really is what it is about having a blockchain based internet uh, where uh, I'm not gonna go too deeply in that. But what happens is you're able to have a presence in the metaverse, which if it's blockchain based, I call it the open metaverse, where you can move from one world to the, to the next. And I talk about this a little in the paper uh, because what happens is that what you're discussing, the open metaverse, there's a lot less control because it is by design decentralized. You can do a lot more. Right. Uh, it's not regulated, for instance. Whereas we have closed metaverses, Cisco hologram, WebEx hologram is an example of that. Uh, Vection's 3D frame is an example of that. Those are examples where we have more controls and you can have specific authorization to create use cases. You have more controls as far as what, what you're allowing people to do. Um, and so the control really differs based on whether it's centralized or decentralized because you're absolutely right in the decentralized web and open metaverse Crazy stuff is happening. It's a bit of the Wild West right now, and it's it difficult is. to protect people. And so especially as we're talking about our customers, I mean, we, we are fans of this stuff just generally as individuals. But as we look at companies, I think the important part to know is this is coming. How do we engage with it? And where do we engage with it? And how do we protect ourselves and our customers? The cool thing, Annie, is that you wrote a couple of blog posts that we have on our website. So Snackers, you can go to our website, just follow the link here to read more about some of the cool things that Annie's working on. Yes, it, it's called my Unpopular Opinion series. <laughs> nice. I tried to get them to let me have my unpopular opinions about the metaverse, Web3, and the future of human-machine interaction. That wasn't very catchy. They're like, we got to cut that down. Yeah, um, Annie, we could, I mean, I could be here talking for hours with you uh, around this because I, I think it's fascinating. Uh, what we're doing in the metaverse and what Cisco's doing actually in, in that uh, field. But we're going to put you on the spot. We ask all of our guests, this, first time comers, um, if you have to pick a superpower, what would that be and why? I think it would be strength. Um, like, like, like physical oh, strength. Nice. I think there's like a the lot Hulk? that you can do. No, because the Hulk's like cool and then like uncool. It's like Jekyll and Hyde. No, I would just have like straight up, like the physique doesn't change. It's just a strength. Like, Think okay. about how much you could do with that. You yeah. could you could help people. I could put together a dam very easily and save communities. I could be the, the heroine. But you could do that without strength in the metaverse. Reincorporation. That was, yeah. Full like that. circle. That was good. Snackers, uh, unfortunately, this is all the time we got today. In case you haven't noticed, Matt looks different. Um, Julio is replacing him today because he's uh, out there spreading the, world, the word to DevNet uh, in our show. So 
thank you for joining us. And Annie, thank you for your time. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, Annie. Thanks for having me.